Our uh, next speaker is Joseph White, also known as uh, Zepp, uh, who is really uh, one of the longest time indie developers that I've met. His uh, first commercial release was in 1993 as a kind of a shareware game distributed on BBSs. Uh, but really, I mean, I became, a, a, became aware of Joseph's work uh, around 2007. I think he released a couple of uh, well-received games under the Lexalawful banner. Um, Zen Puzzle Garden was one, and uh, Chocolate Castle was the other one. So, uh, you know, really a indie developer of some repute. But Joseph's here today to uh, talk to us as the inventor of the fantasy uh, console concept. You know, what is a fantasy console? Uh, Fantasy Console is a is like a hardware platform for games that exists only in emulation, like only as a kind of set of specifications and an emulator. And uh, Joseph invented that or sort of started that idea, which is sort of gathering steam now with the Pico 8 fan Fantasy Console. And you might sort of think to yourself, if you've never used a Fantasy Console, you know, why? What's the, you know, what's the, what's the attraction of that? What's the point of that? And I think, uh, for me, I would kind of encapsulate it as it simplifies and scopes down game development in a way that just makes it more enjoyable. And, you know, I, uh, over the last year, I ran a, a class where students make games exclusively in Pico 8. And really, this, this one thing summed it up for me. I was, I, you know, I finished the class, you know, sent out all my grades, and I noticed one of the students uh, writing a tweet on Twitter which says, you know, we've been using exclusively Pico 8 in my class this semester, and in my last few months at college, I finally understand why game, game, why game development is fun. And I really can't say it any better than that. Uh, so please uh, join me in welcoming Joseph. Hi. Thank you. Um, so I'm really glad that, um, that Bennett gave you a, a sort of introduction to what a fantasy console is, because I still don't like to explain it myself. <laughs> um, but um, so it's it's a combination of identifying what's already happening in the software world with with tools like um, Puzzle Script and Twine, um, you know things like th things like this that have an identity that expresses itself in the work made with it and creates a nice space for people to work in. Um, but also uh, because I needed to um, come up with some language to explain what I was doing to my. Uh, with, with my work to my users. Um, so I've color coded this talk um, just to help navigate a bit. The, the warm colors mean they are familiar to me, and this is, you know, these sort of straightforward things um, just what Pico 8 is and how it came about. The, the cold colors are um, a little, little more scary. They are, you know, text heavy and just theory and musing about uh, what fantasy consoles are and and uh, what it means for tools in general. But then I'm going to try and bring it back to um, Pico 8's particular goal, which is to create a a, a cozy space. Um, and I'll talk about what I think coziness is later. So uh, I'll give you a quick. Uh, just by the way, how many people have actually used? Pico 8 or roughly know what it is. Um, so leave your hand up if you've made, only if you've made a cartridge. Okay, that's great. Um, by the way, thank you for making cartridges. <laughs> um, so it's a fantasy console. The thing that makes a console a console is not the hardware. I think the important thing is everything else. Um, so the, the, the community, the, um, the design culture that forms around that, um, the tools that come with the console uh, re really shape the work that's made, made with it. And uh, the way that it acts as a distribution platform. Um, but you do have to choose specifications. So these, these are carefully selected to give Pico 8 its own character. Um, I went with the smallest resolution I could that can still express roughly um, you know, any game that someone's interested in exploring. The, the palette was a big deal. I spent a lot of time working on the palette. Um, and you, you'll see later that the design of the palette is actually sort of an analogy for the design of the whole system. Uh, 
Um, the choice of having only 32 cartridges, uh, 32K cartridges was also important uh, because I'm, I'm valuing design over content. I want people to just make something, capture the concept, and then just move on to something else and to feel okay to do that. Uh, the sound, yeah, it's, it follows, follows suit. It's, it's uh, minimal and just does the job. Um, and maybe the most important feature of Pico 8 is simply that it has the tools built in. So, uh, you know, naturally I'm giving this talk in, in Pico 8, so if I press escape, um, I get a command prompt. And so you can just type Lua commands directly. Um, if I reboot, this is what it looks like when it starts up, and I'll talk about why it's important to boot into a prompt later. Um, so here's a, a sprite editor. Um, I'll see if I can make something real fast. Sorry if this doesn't turn out well. Okay, this is just a standard test bunny. I use I use it a lot. Um, this is a map editor. It's just it's just a grid of eight bit uh, data. So you, you can decide what the meaning is. It's it's sort of quite you know. I'm trying to remove the semantics. This is a sound editor. Let's see if the sound works. Maybe, I'll see if I can tune up the volume. Okay, so, uh, yeah, the sound is not much data, but you can use it to make, you know, roughly what you need. And music is sound that's played slowly. Okay, let's see if you can hear this. That's beautiful. <laughs> okay, so if you go into the tracker mode, this is the same data, but just presented differently. So this is, this is sort of like an um, you know, Amiga-style tracker. Um, and you can assemble music into, um, uh, sorry, sounds into music uh, by adding channels. So for example, if I, I put like a bassy thing in uh, and Okay, we can ship it, right? <laughs> um, so this is the code editor. Uh, about, so so I, I wanted everything to be contained. About half of the users do everything in this horrible font. Um, and I, I wanted to make you suffer today by reading this font for this presentation so you can um, feel what it's like for a Pico 8 user. But also maybe you can see that you get used to it. It's surprising that you can fit this into 128 squared. Um, so, what am I doing? Draw. So it's just Lua. Um, so clear screen. I love CLS. As soon as I type CLS, I feel good. <laughs> um, I don't know if you're uh, sort of familiar with you know old basic machines. Uh, CLS was you know it's what you type first. It's sort of it feels like a ceremony, you know, when you're starting a new program. Uh, when, you, when you type CLS, you're not just clearing the screen, you're clearing your mind and your soul, <laughs> preparing for something new. Um, okay, so, uh, let's say, plus I divide by 16, and radius, and duplicate that. Uh, I'll give it a different period. I don't know if this is gonna work. Um, Please bear with me while I debug this. Um, so this is this is a command sprite, and we're going to just draw a sprite one at x and y. Okay, great. <laughs> so there's our test bunny doing his work, and um, you can print. Of course, print is another like classic basic thing. Uh, I, I really wanted to put weird characters into the code editor, so you can just type, you know, things like this. Um, so the size of S times 2. And color. I'll see if that works. Okay, great. There's, so there's a program. And now I want to share this with my friend, so I can, I can save it as a, as a PNG file. 
Ah, uh, let me take a um, screen sh a, a, a label. Uh, whoa, that's not what I wanted. <laughs> Capture label. Okay, now I can save it as p dot p eight dot png. And so now we have this f this file. Um, so this is the cartridge. Whoops. Okay, let me zoom in. So I, I so all of the data is stored in the red, green, blue data. It's it's encoded in the low bits of the RGBA channels. So if you look closely, it's actually um, fuzzy. And so you can send this cartridge to someone else, and they can load it in the Pico8 and read the source code and do everything that you did. What? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, uh, it's just to sort of make it feel more real. So here's here's a. Um, Here's a demo cartridge that I released in the first alpha like two or three years ago. Th yeah, three years ago, and never updated. And, and I just, like everyone, like thousands of people have seen this to-do list at the top. <laughs> like to-do levels and monsters. <laughs> um, it turned out to be a good thing to do because I sort of like showed by example, it's okay, just release stuff, it's fine, you know. You know, you're among friends. Um, so this is Jelpy. Um, and it's, it uses Pico 8 in a straightforward way, like you, you know, draw sprites and, and put them put them on the map. Um, so I'll just show you one thing quickly, which is uh, I added a, a, a corrupt mode. Um, so if you if you poke, I'll clear the screen. It does have a, a memory, so if you poke somewhere in the memory, um, uh, gosh, let's see. Okay, see those see those little dots. That's that's because um, uh, one byte, you know, covers two pixels on the screen, so, uh, and so there is a semi-realistic um, memory mapping. If I if I randomly poke stuff into the the memory range every frame, it looks like this. It, it doesn't crash because the code is actually in a separate, you know, like, magic lure section, which is not touched by this. Um, and the reason I show this to you is because I think it's an important way to, um, to demonstrate, like, what the underlying... Gl glitches are interesting because they show... Oh, yeah, that's... So you heard it clobbering the music. Oh, I'll run it a couple of times so you can see different things happening. Here's... Um, so clearly it's it clobbering the map. Uh, that sounds like like one of the music filters went on, and then like a, a flag saying if something's a monster flipped, and then a whole bunch of things turned into monsters. Um, so when you see glitches in, in games or anything, it, it sort of shows the underlying material of the system. And one thing, like the first thing I did as soon as everything was running in Pico 8 was, okay, I need to glitch this <laughs> and see if it glitches nicely. Um, okay, so uh, it also has like a um, explorer. These are some things made with Pico 8. Two hiking cats having a conversation. Um, some really crazy technical things. Um, more technical things. A game about hugging, hugging other, hugging monsters to make them your friends, so you can get love back from them and, and you know hug more people. Um, uh, Kind of hardcore platformy things. Um, I, I love this one. This is um, this is by by a, a friend of mine um, who loves using Pico 8 for things it shouldn't do. Um, so, you know, the point of calligraphy is is the the, the touch and the nuance and the the, the fine detail. Well, that, okay, that's the best one I ever drew. Is <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, <laughs> it's supposed to be funny because it goes wrong. Um, you know, it's, it's uh, just an eight-directional controller. So he put inertia on the on the brush. Um, th this I also love. It's a, a game about drawing, uh, about um, making spider webs, um, and it does have you know goals and, and scores and, and action. But I, I just like to um, take time to build spider webs. Uh, okay, so I'll just draw one strand. Yeah. So you can, you know, connect the strands and make a spider web. Um, yeah, okay, so that's, that's what Pico 8 is. Uh, let me go back to the slides. Let's see if it picks up. Okay. Um, so, 
how did it happen? Um, Pico8 is, is a really enjoyable project to work on because there are so many motivations and like practical considerations and you know aesthetic um, ambitions that that all folded into it that kind of carried um, Pico8 along. It's one of those projects that feel like once you choose the the um, the goals or the problem, some you, somehow you just carried along to the you know to the result. Um, so I had a bunch of motivations. I, I always made tools since I was a kid. I just loved making pixel drawing programs and, and drawing in them, and that just never stopped. And um, that's you know a, a key feature of Pico8. Um, I, I wanted to make something that lets me work how I like to work, um, rather than fighting against um, other tools. And I wanted to make I wanted to get rid of all of these. Um, interfering thoughts about what I'm developing for, like which platform, and just pick sort of like a house style and just make games in that abstract space and then worry about how to actually present it to the world. Uh, and also I'm just frustrated with <laughs> software. Software sucks. It's terrible. Um, uh, yeah, I, I, I get, so I don't, I'm a calm person in general. I don't get road rage. I have no idea what that feels like, but I have software rage. Like the the time between doing clicking on something and waiting for half a second for a window to pop up, um, that half a second, my mind is completely lizard brain raging animal, <laughs> um, and I feel it's it's much more disruptive to our creative work than than we generally realize, and of course we realize it anyway. Uh, there's some moments that I wanted to capture that I wanted to sort of work backwards from. One of them is rummaging through a, a box of unlabeled Amiga discs or Commodore 64 discs and not knowing what you're going to get. Like, wh you don't even know what you're looking at when you run the program. Uh, I also like the feeling of, I, I noticed that I did really good work on napkins that I knew that I was going to throw away. Um, and I started to work on napkins <laughs> because um, you know, I was in that space and I, I felt like I'm going to do something good if I've got a napkin. And then I just ended up with a collection of napkins in my bag. Uh, but um, I, you know, I wondered if, if uh, I, I could sort of do that with, with tools. Um, this is from the demo scene. Uh, how many of you are familiar with the demo scene? OK, the rest of you, you're in for a treat. Go and check out the, the demo scene. Um, so the demo scene is, is just a whole bunch of people making programs for each other for the love of it, demonstrating not just programming ability, but just making programs that you sit back and watch and are interesting for a variety of reasons. Um, but I always felt like, because there's no commercial platform for, demo, for, for demos, um, they all, always felt like, like little messages to other programmers to, to entertain each other and connect with each other. And being in New Zealand and not knowing anyone in the demo scene, for years and years, every time I watched a demo, I felt a little personal connection. Um, I like cute problems versus annoying problems. I, I, I feel relieved when I have to write a compression algorithm or something like this. I feel like, ah, oh, you know, thank goodness I can do some computer science. Um, in the modern software world, a lot of work is making glue, glue code to stick things together. Uh, and also, I, I wanted to make something that carries you along um, and doesn't make you feel un under pressure to do anything in, in particular, um, to be playful. Um, OK, so yet another layer of motivation. Uh, I'll skip through this quickly because it's, it's a little bit out of scope. But this is the project that I started with. This is, this is another fantasy console. and. Uh, this was first released in 2011. Um, let me just stick some trees in here. So this this fantasy console is is more interested in visual style. So the display is a volumetric um, cube, a block of of cubes, and um, it's it's good for you know things like destructible physics and things like this. Um, but when I started working on this, I didn't have the fantasy console idea. And I was trying. I had different parts to it, um, but it was. I was presenting it as a monolithic thing. So I had game modes, and I had instead of tools, I would just say, "Okay, it's a level designer." But I wanted people to feel like it's a platform, and that things made in it is is theirs, that they had authorship. Um, but I had this this big language problem. Uh, here's here's. Uh, 
so here, here's another Voxon cartridge. Um, it's the, the hug game that you saw before uh, remade. This is Benjamin Sol's game. Um, remade in 3D. So you can see I can like tilt the, the display. Um, okay, so... The problem is that it's monolithic and I didn't know how to present work made in it as, as something that felt like a you know, separate creation. Um, and I wanted people to, f to feel that they were the authors of this thing. They weren't just making a level for another platform. And so that's, that's what gave me the, the concept of cartridges as an analogy for a, a basic unit of, of expression that, that's shareable. Um, but it took me a long time to get to fantasy consoles from, from that. I don't know why, I just couldn't see it. I, I had Pico 8 and I had the idea of cartridges in Voxtron, but it never occurred to me to, to make Voxtron uh, a fantasy console in the same way. But it is now, like the next time uh, Voxtron gets an update, it'll be a fully formed, it'll come out of its cocoon and be a fantasy console butterfly. Um, yeah, so I, I, I've mentioned these things before. I want Pico 8 to be self-contained, to have a whole ecosystem to have its own identity and to feel real. Um, and feeling real when it's it's just a piece of software is um, interesting. I'm I'm really uh, I, I can do things like like uh, release things on um, cartridges or, or rather export to cartridges so that uh, you know you have this language and these analogies in your mind so it feels um, more like a real thing. Um, and also, I'm not trying to capture a moment in history. There are a whole bunch of really lovely old machines, Commodore 64s, BBC Micros, that their specifications um, were, they, you know, they came out of the requirements of that time. But now we can just make anything we want. So um, instead of trying to um, capture something that's already happened, I'm designing from scratch. There's too many design rules. Um, I want it to be small. I want the I, I want to choose things for the users, um, so that it doesn't really matter how they use them. It, it will make something that's not terrible. So an example is a box of crayons where the, the colors are chosen so that you know there's no two colors that don't really work together, and the specs should um, interact with each other nicely. It's useless to have a whole bunch of graphics and sound if you don't have enough code to actually run the, the graphics and sound, for example. Um, and I need to put friction in the right places so that people work on interesting problems and don't have to think about things which are not interesting. And to kind of sum it up, I want Pico 8 to feel like a medium. Um, so it has qualities to it the way that Canvas has a texture, or you know, brushes have a, a weight or a behavior. So these are the particular choices that I'll, I'll just quickly um, go over. The um, the screen size was um, it's square, so that the, there is no axis which is primary. It's it's one choice you can remove is which way to put your action, and also it just feels strange. It feels different. Even though it's very impractical, and you know, people often sort of complain, like, why, why can't we just make it a bit wider so that it fits on, on modern monitors? Um, but I, it's it's another thing which sort of adds to the feeling that it's it's a real thing, and that you're entering a different space. Uh, and also, it's it's uh, compatible with Voxtron. So the thing that I showed you before, it's the display is actually 64 Pico 8 screens stacked on top of each other. Um, okay, so I mentioned before that designing the palette is, is sort of analogous to the whole project. Uh, and I, I found that there are these, these two processes that I go through. Uh, one is annealing, where I have many, many placeholder solutions to design problems. Um, and then as time goes on, I reduce the t gr gradually reduce the temperature of how much they jump around and watch how they interact with each other. Um, so that at the end of the, the project, they're m making very small movements in relation to each other. And the other one is folding, where you have many different requirements, and they they create gravity and pull things in different directions. So in the case of the, the palette, uh, don't worry about that. 
um, I, I wanted to have eight looping colors, like a rainbow on the top, so that you can, you know, just um, have a nice ramp straight out of the gates. I needed to find a grayscale ramp, but I also wanted to do something with the blues. So this, you know, this this color here is interesting. It's it's it has a role in many different contexts, um, and I wanted to have uh, some cold colors that go in, that lead into a, a warm palette uh, for you know thing, situations where you want to have have warm natural lit scenes. Um, so yeah, the, the palette. Uh, the palette is, is sort of a, a, a tidy small example of how the, the whole um, project developed. So in the case of the specifications, for example, the, um, you know, the code size would pull against the, the um, size of the sound effects, or, um, or one API function would you know, create more motivation to use another function or, or not to have it at all. Um, so everything kind of danced around a lot, and then over time it's, it, it slowed down. And I think that's, you know, most people go through that, that process. But um, uh, it's, it's sort of something that I like to consciously recognize and put in my notes, you know, where I am at, in that process of, of an eating. Um, yeah, as I mentioned, cartridge size is basically chosen so that you can't make big things. I think it's just really liberating to make small things and to be and to feel okay to make small things. Um, it 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 it, make, it forces you to think more about design than manufacturing a lot of content. And and to focus on on what's important to you and throw away things that are not important. And it forces you to to confront cute problems like how to fit your data in. And often, you know, those problems lead you down a, a new path that you wouldn't have otherwise uh, considered. Um, yeah, the sound, the sound effects uh, follow with the same principles. They are as small as they can possibly be. And you can't really go too wrong. You can draw random um, sounds and hold down control to get a pentatonic scale. And, you know, you can use that for your title screen music. The, uh, the API is minimal, not just to keep things simple, but also because I don't want anything magic to happen in Pico 8. If you want to make a collision function, or if you want two things to collide, you just have to write the code. Um, or, you ha or you have to copy it from another cartridge. Um, and as a result, I think you know, people will be naturally introduced to classic problems and have the satisfaction of solving them. Um, there's, a, you know, there's no sort function. I, I added a sort function just while I'm developing things for my own personal use, but then I took it out. <laughs> I'm not trying to solve engineering problems. Um, and sometimes I feel sorry about that. <laughs> um, so for, for in the case of the sort function, um, so for this spinny thing, all you need is a bubble sort. Bubble sort works really well because the relative um, distance of the items doesn't change that much per frame because it's it's slowly rotating, um, and you know so it's just a little snippet that you can paste in, and it's it's really satisfying. So here is almost the entire API, um, and you know I, I I'm really tired of massive APIs that I, I don't don't even know where to start navigating, and so I, I had a lot of motivation to keep it as small as possible. Um, so, yeah, I, w I wanted an API that you can just hold in the palm of your hand and see the whole thing at, at once. Um, yeah, some system callbacks. Uh, so after I started getting cartridges, there were three areas of change driven by what users were doing. Um, a lot of people were naturally using fill patterns, to, you know, to get around the 16 colors and to do 3D effects and things like this, and. Um, I, I just really enjoyed the way that they look like knitted material, like at that resolution. And so I added fill patterns, partly because I, I, you know, I just like that aesthetic and I want to sort of reduce the friction on that so that there are more cartridges with fill patterns. Um, and also it's just a great way to introduce people to, um, to binary representation because when you're uh, expressing the fill pattern you need to you know, get out a little 4x4 four four grid and do the powers of two and add the numbers together to get the, the value that you're after. 
uh, the code was too small on the first release, and so I, and people were minifying their code. That was a big problem. It defeated the purpose of having shareable code. So I changed the code size limit from ASCII characters to tokens. Um, you know, so one word or one variable name is a token, and that helped a lot uh, to avoid minification. And also, it just feels cuter spending tokens. Um, multi cards is interesting. I you know, there were a lot of people who were pushing against the boundary of the 32k um, card size and wanted to do bigger things. So I, I didn't want to to break that rule. I wanted the cartridge size to be sacred for the reasons that I mentioned. But I so I introduced the concept of multi cards, where you can export a cartridge or you can export a, a Pico 8 executable that has other cartridges inside it that you can load and run. So if you're using it, uh, you, you can still feel like there are cartridges and you can sort of have both both worlds. But the interesting thing is that after I released it, nobody actually makes multi cards. <laughs> so people don't know what they want. Um, the boot sequence is, is important because um, because of framing and presentation, it feels like you're in a, a new place. You're inside the machine. And when, when it boots, there is a chime. You know, the did it And I think it, it's, it's, um, it kind of calls you back to what you were thinking. It's like you know, me typing CLS. Um, I noticed that the opposite thing happened when I was doing uh, contract work, and I was miserable doing this work because I had to use you know, Xcode or something like this. And every time I turned on my Macintosh and I heard that chime, I could feel the back of my head burning, like just <laughs> from the chime, just because of Pavlovian conditioning. Um, and so I'm trying to reclaim that. <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to wipe that. Um, OK, so. So now we're entering the blue zone. Fantasy consoles are basically impressionist hardware. When you're designing one, you're not thinking about how to solve engineering problems. You're thinking about the feeling of the person using the console and, and how to provoke all of those associations and emotions. Um, and it's really just in the eye of the beholder if, if something is, is a console or feels like a console. Uh, you have to choose when it starts not being real. So in the, in the case of Pico 8, there's no instruction set, for example. There is you know, Lua, um, the Lua virtual machine, but I just didn't need the instruction set to, you know, to feel tangible. And language is very important. I think that's like a, reoccur a reoccurring theme in previous talks. Um, just calling something a cartridge just completely changes the user's expectations and perception. Um, and uh, yeah, so all of, all, all of these things also help Pico 8 to act as a medium because of these uh, expectations and, and just the, f the feel of it. Um, so th you know, those are the things that, that give Pico 8, it's, uh, or any fantasy console, its identity. But I'm not, you know, I'm not trying to prescribe what a fantasy console is. I'm, I'm, it's, it's just a, a family resemblance of um, features. Um, and I couldn't see what I was doing until I had Pico 8 and, um, and Voxtron. So I, I saw this from Avery's talk, the, the idea that once you have two projects and you can see them next to each other, uh, that gives you a space, a, a frame of reference, and then you can see what you're doing. And uh, I found that so useful that I even went so far as to design a third console just as scaffolding. So I, I designed a Pico 16 just to remind myself to not make that. <laughs> like, Pico 16 does not work at all. And so it's sort of a negative frame of references that, that pushes design decisions away from it. Um, and I did also design a, a, a Pico 64. I, I will never make anything called Pico 64. Um, but the, and, and the question was, what would it look like if it was um, the same conceptual distance from Voxtron and Pico 8? I don't need to make that thing, but it's just a, you know, a useful tool in designing something to, to ask that question and to go through the process 
just so that you can see what you're doing um, immediately. Um, yeah, so there's a bunch of other console things that I've, I've mentioned, like, um, like puzzle script and, and whatnot, uh, that feel quite different and have their own identity. Um, yeah, there's a bunch of other things which are sort of on the boundary of what, what, uh, what I'm doing too, like uh, you know, even just modding games to make other things has that feel because um, you know, they have their own communities and, and their own tools. And game, even the concept of game jams, I mean, game jams also create a, a different space and a different feeling to work in. Um, so there, are some, there is also some family resemblance with fantasy consoles. Framing. Yeah, so Pico 8 is different enough from things that people have used in the past, both as a player and a developer, that when you see it boot, you don't really expect anything of it, and all bets are off. And so I can kind of get away with anything. Um, so, for example, I, you know, I showed you the corruption thing before. When you reboot, when you reset a cartridge, it injects some random mem uh, values into memory to get a nice glitchy effect. But I, I forgot that I had mapped some of the permanent storage to memory. And so every time someone reset a cart cartridge, it was sometimes clobbering their data. But because it's, I mean, that's a bad thing. <laughs> but because it's a fantasy console, my users enjoyed it. They thought this was like a, this was an intentional humorous thing. And they, they started working on how to do voting logic to store their data, you know, reliably, things like this. Um, they're too kind. Um, I, I, I fixed it. <laughs> so there are very, there are very fuzzy boundaries between tools that you're designing for yourself or that you're using and the medium that you're working with and your process for making things. It's, it's something that when you're designing things you have to do anyway. You have to, you have to find a space of possibilities to work inside. And that might be you know, following Disney's 10 rules of animation or it might be um, you know, picking a, 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 a particular platform or audience to, to work with. And I mean, they, they are clearly separate concepts, but you can say anything about you know, any combination of these things which couples them in some way. So we might as well just make a equivalence spinner the medium. Yay! Yeah. <laughs> okay, let's let's try again. I don't want to talk about that. Medium. Okay, so so just by just by using a tool, the, you, you don't you don't need to state a manifesto. The, the, the tool sometimes has the manifesto in, in, inside itself because it lets you do things which are congruent with, with that set of design um, values. Okay, let's try again. <sighs> medium. Ah, oh, I hate medium. Muse, okay. Um, sometimes a tool even invites you to make something for it. You know, have you, have you ever seen something online, uh, just some, some way to express yourself and you feel like, okay, I want to make something for that, and I don't know why. It's, it's, it's somehow inviting. Um, by the way, that was all totally rigged. <laughs> Sorry. Um, yeah, so uh, tools can do those things. They can, they can capture, you, you can design tools as part of your process. The, the way that a watchmaker makes tools to make the watches is just an unavoidable step in the process, and, and the tools have reached back to the I mean, the, the medium, of course, influences the tools, and the tools have reached into the process and the, the product. It's, it's all a very big, fuzzy blob. Um, and so, so I guess, I mean, if you want to sort of step back a little bit, what you're trying to do is, is find design spaces to work in. Um, you are, when you're a designer and you, you get into a design rat hole, into a quagmire, you, the only way to get out is to, to, to pop up one, one um, frame of your stack and, and sort of do meta design and see, you know, see 
what are the boundaries that you're operating inside? So it's, it's just something that designers do anyway. And when you're making tools, you can, you can crystallize or formalize part of that process. You can also use it to, f to try to find fertile creative spaces. So instead of designing the thing, you design the boundaries in such a way that you know that when you're operating inside those boundaries, um, the possibi possibility space is rich enough that you just you can't help but run into interesting things and you get sort of uh, carried along. So, so to come back to, this is the last um, section, to come back to Pico 8, if I were to characterize the design space that Pico 8 is trying to, to offer, it's to be cozy. Um, cuteness, I don't really want to go into cuteness. I, I feel like design spaces and machines can be cute and I don't know why. They just they give you a certain feeling when you when you look at them, and it's something about being small and inviting and somewhat on rails, but it but paradoxically it gives you a, a feeling of of freedom. And you can in in a cozy design space you don't feel afraid to do anything wrong. Um, you can leave your ego behind and not try to being uh, impressing anybody or anything like this, you just want to make something for the, for the love of making. Um, you, you feel playful when you're in a cozy design space. You feel compelled to explore and um, you want to make connections with other people and send them messages in a bottle. And a cozy design space, I think, um, invites you to make something for it. So something that a cozy design space is not, or what it's fighting against, is, is decision fatigue. There are so many things that you need to think about when you're doing a project, and, and many of them really interfere with, with uh, design and creative thought. How big the project is, what is my personal motivation for doing it, what's it gonna look like, how am I gonna distribute it to other people, um, and how is it gonna physically exist? Things like this. I want to throw all of that away and say to Pico 8 users, okay, I'll, don't worry about it, I'll take care of that. Just, just make a Pico 8 card. So we are, we are looking for boundaries that feel good to be inside. But because we're, around of the, we're aware of the boundaries, um, it also makes sense to go outside them and make things that are not supposed to be in that space. And that's interesting too. So this is, this is ambiguous. You can have freedom by virtue of the fact that there are boundaries, um, which is maybe counterintuitive because you're in this richer space. It's, it's sort of like, it's because you can see more. If you have no boundaries, then the, the space is so sparse. It, it's like being out in space. You're, you're looking at the stars in the distance, and they are interesting, complex things, but they just all appear as points of light. Whereas if you find some boundaries, it's more like being down on the surface of a planet with a, a lush jungle and interesting life, but it's just one planet. Being in a cute space gives you license to, to abandon things and just move on to the next thing, because you run out of space and you have to, there's no choice. And so you, you, you can blame that on me, the creator of the space. So, there are two processes going on. There's the process of the user making things and the process of designing and making Pico 8. And I'm going to try to um, tie them together a little bit by saying that these, these tools, they have an implicit design manifesto built into them. And in Pico 8's case, or Cozy Design Space's case, um, the, the principles are that small things matter. You can make small things, they're valuable by themselves or as components for other things that can be remixed. Uh, I, I feel much more touched by small things um, that, I, that I see other people making. Um, I don't know why, I just love to see isolated little thoughts. It's okay to make something and just move on to the next thing. You can find boundaries 
and work, work inside them. And if you find one of these spaces, it, you, ca you can be carried along by it. I, I'm not saying like, um, you know, follow a new path doesn't mean, um, it doesn't mean that, you know, it doesn't mean make, make, make new things or find a new space. It means let yourself be carried along by the, the qualities and properties of a space. And that you can just, you know, it's okay to ignore the real world sometimes. Uh, and so if I, if I try to reduce all of them, all of those five things, then I think cozy spaces are about working in a cozy place. Thank you very much. Uh, okay, I guess we have a little bit of time for, uh, for questions. So um, I'm just going to throw it open because you already answered the question that I was going to ask, which is what do you mean, is this, uh, everybody can, yep, what do you mean by cuteness? And you don't want to answer that <laughs> question, uh, which is fair enough. I think that's probably uh, a lot. But uh, do we have questions in the audience for, for Joseph? They're in the back. First of all, thank you very much. Um, I learned a lot. You almost invented a whole new genre called cozy spaces because I find that everything you said applies to other similar dimensions. The idea that there's boundaries, the idea that it's separate. And, um, I'm involved in a project, and you've just given me a theoretical. I'm, I'm happy to hit that. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay. okay. The question is, what are you working on next? Um, I, I really want to actually just join the party and be a Pico 8 user. <laughs> I, so at, at, at the moment, I feel like I'm sort of in the kitchen making snacks. <laughs> and I can hear everyone laughing and talking in the other room. <laughs> and uh, at, at 1.0, I just want to um, join the party and, and drink some wine. <laughs> Get drunk. Yeah. Uh, Matt. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The question. Sorry. Yeah. For the, for the video. The question is. Uh, yeah. What What are you going to bring from Pico Eight uh, back to Voxtron? So, yeah. So, so Voxtron really spawned Pico Eight. Um, but yeah. Now, now Pico Eight is is leading Voxtron, and I, I'm really just um, transplanting the entire format. The, the entire fantasy console format. So the the cartridge browser, the you know cartridge sharing and exporting, and um, the the way that things are scripted. For example, the the Voxron API is just a superset of Pico 8's API. So you can write Pico 8 programs in Voxtron, but then just draw 3D things in the in the volume. So it it helped to 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 crystallize what Voxtron is. Oh, and to, to answer your question about the time frame, uh, so so it's very difficult to to juggle these two large projects, um, especially because you know Pico Eight is very active right now. I want to keep the ball rolling, um, but I'm doing a, a vo the Fantasy Console release this year. Let me let me just say this year. Yeah. Uh, Josh. Can you talk about the factors that made you choose to use Lua? Okay. Yeah. Why did you choose Lua? Yeah. I, I really wanted to use Basic. Partly because of nostalgia, at first, um, and the most practical way to do that was to. I hadn't really done, you know, languages and compilers. I did a philosophy degree just to avoid doing the compilers paper. <laughs> <laughs> um, the easiest way to do that at first was to compile from Basic to Lua, and then I noticed. I started noticing some features in Lua that I really liked. And pretty soon it was just Lua. <laughs> um, but also, I, 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 through that process, I got to know the history of Lua um, and, and you know, read the source code a lot. And I, aesthetically, I just really started to enjoy Lua. And I, I got over my uh, 
my reservations about Lua, things things like you know um, one based arrays really bothered me. But you can get into like a a, a Lua way of thinking about things. You, you can have zero based arrays in Lua. It's it's fine. It's just it's just a table. Yeah. Uh, do you think of Lua as a cute language? <laughs> so uh, I, I I do. I think it's uh, I, I think it's cute. Um, the so, so Pico 8 does have a limit on the CPU. It's the number of Lua code virtual machine instructions. And so one of aspect of cuteness, I think, is that you can um, project human qualities on the thing and, and feel like it's a, a little animal earnestly working away. <laughs> and that's how I feel about the, the Lua virtual machine. Okay. Yeah. Uh, just uh, in terms of the visual aesthetic, I'm wondering what stuff from that time. I, I teach an 80s class here, and it was actually showing my students the Atari Lynx, mm -hmm. the, the ones who had worked with the Pico, were like, oh, this is actually a little, like, it reminded them of it more than the Commodore or the Amiga. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm wondering what stuff from that, you know, original time period you kind of look at. It's like, oh, this is kind of the aesthetic that I So I, I definitely, you know, was influenced from some different machines. The, the Commodore 64 palette I, I really love. It's, it's clearly different from the Pico, six, uh, the Pico 8 palette, um, but I, I, I grabbed the sort of the principle, which is, is to have color ramps that, that drift across hues and odd color replacement um, options and you know uh, forks and color ramps, things like this that Commodore 64 palette pixel artists have been refining and using for a long time. Uh, and the tracker is very heavily inspired by the Amiga. Um, I liked the garish colors of EGA, but it's you know very blunt, so I wanted to have some uh, sort of be more tertiary in the color scheme. Um, the the feeling of the BBC Micro, I think, was was uh, you know of of um, writing a pr uh, booting into a, a command prompt and writing a program from scratch was um, probably from the BBC Micro. I mean, that was shared with other machines. It's just the one that I used. So yeah, there were many small, isolated uh, inspirations that I took from retro machines. OK, more questions. Uh, Alison. Um, so there's a great presentation. Thank you. You um, talked a lot about this being like a tool that you, that you like that caters to your own ideas about what a tool should be like, and you express a desire to yourself and you use your own What I'm what I'm hoping that you could do is like talk about do you think that this is better than other ways to make games? Do you think that you can get on something universal that has like virtues that extend beyond it just being something that expresses something that you Right, so the, the question is, is, is this uh, a better way to make games or is this just a particular thing that right. you like? So I, I think it's particular. If I, if I, if I'm, if I'm trying to offer something to improve the process of making games. It's not this particular choice. It's, it's the idea that you can be conscious of the reach that your tools have on your work. And that uh, you know, tools are not um, isolated things that are used to implement ideas. You can incorporate designing and developing tools um, as part of your creative process. Uh, and one over here in the bit towards back. Uh, what, what are game engines or programming environments uh, uh, represented like the opposite manifesto? So yeah, so what's an uncozy game engine? Well, just, so any engine which, which is as general as possible. Which, well, just, you, you, you know, Unity or, or any, any IDE, you know. Um, but, I mean, within that, um, you know, that's not the end of the story because there are clearly cozy spaces inside Unity and it, it, it does a good job of reducing you know, friction. You don't need to worry so much about porting to different platforms. A little follow-up. If, if someone made a Unity plugin that just wrapped Pico 8 up, mm -hmm. how would you feel about it? <laughs> yeah, I, I think it would, it would work. And I think to some Pico 8 users, the idea of wrapping, that, you know, like even knowing that it was there might bother them. But I think the, the, I, the goal is to climb up the ladder and then kick the ladder away and not worry about what's actually happening on the outside. Mm -hmm. uh, Towards back there. Um, I'm curious with the color palette, you don't have the actual true red? 
they have violence. Yeah, there are, there are... Okay, so the, yeah, the yeah. question is, okay, if sorry. you don't have red in your palette, you can't have violence, you can't have blood. <laughs> um, there are surprisingly few violent Pico 8 games. Mm. Partly because you can't represent things, you know, in a, a gruesome way. I would love it if that was one of the reasons, that there wasn't like a, a red color. But I, I actually, I don't really like straight red or, or any straight primary colors. Um, the, the, the Pico 8 red is really quite pink. And a, a lot of these colors I, I you know, I, I used in past projects and they just sort of became colors that I liked. And that was one of them. Um, but when I when I tried it out as the top and bottom of the of the editing tools, I felt it was a really good pattern breaker. When you see an IDE, it's usually sort of white and blue and things like this. But because it has this strange red pink title bar, I felt that like by itself um, didn't mean that it's for anybody in in particular. Uh, so that was one reason that I that I chose that that red. So you, you often, you're coming back to this idea of things that you picked because of your own personal taste. Is this, I mean, does, does Pico 8, and by extension, do the games made in Pico 8, are they in some way a self-portrait of you? Um, so it's really, it's, you know, I, I want, I, I am greedy. I want, to, I want to claim some credit for things made in, in Pico 8. Um, which is, you know, it, it, it goes against um, the, the goal to, you know, give people authorship. But it's, it's unavoidable that anything you make is going to be a reflection of, of you, I think. Uh, how are we doing for, for time? One, one or two more? Yeah, sure. Okay, we've got one right here. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, I was wondering how you feel uh, open source developers who build tools around Pico fit into the cozy space. Yeah, no. So how do open yeah. source developers fit into the to the cozy space? Uh, so, open source implementations of the API are great because it it makes you feel safer that your cartridges are going to live forever, and there's more things you can do with it. Um, and you know, in the long term, I'm going I'm you know working hard to make sure that no one will lose their Pico 8 cartridges. But uh, but there are reason for, reasons for, good reasons for it being closed source. Part, part of it is that there, there is a, a very large secret basement to Pico 8 that I don't want anyone to know about yet. Um, uh, please don't tell anyone. <laughs> um, and, and also, I think if it was open source at this point, there would be many variations of Pico 8 that would sort of eat away at that shared experience. You know, everyone knows what Pico 8 is, how big a cartridge is, what the the palette and screen limitations are, and that's why it's valuable, I think. Um, so, uh, over time, it, you know, it should be more open and, and uh, flexible and um, and safe, you know, <coughs> safe in, in regards to preserving software, uh, but it would be bad in the short term for that reason, yeah. So, th there's good and bad things about the open source versions. Uh, we'll take one more question. Uh, go ahead, Andrew. Oh, there is a there is a Pico Four. There is a um, there's a, 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 a I think it's called Pico Boy, um, made by Josh Millard, and uh, it's great fun to develop for. He I, I don't have it handy, but um, it has you know it has a little tiny screen and you hold the. So th th there are a bunch of Pico Eight cartridges that follow the follow the the, the idea of Pico Eight itself. And uh, for example, there was a tiny TV jam where the, the screen is 11 by 10, and uh, you, know, you, you have this little voxel television that you can develop for, yeah. Uh, okay, well, just, remind, uh, just to remind you to put your uh, lunch topics in the box uh, during the coffee break, and uh, all that is left is to thank Joseph White for a wonderful talk. Thank you very much.